All right, what's going on everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. And in this video, we continue our mechanics of material sequence with column buckling. And what I want to do in this video is describe the behavior of members subject to axial compression and derive the critical or Euler load equation and describe how the support conditions can influence the critical load. So to get started, let's talk about what a column is. So you're probably familiar if you've looked at trusses, what we called a single force member. And so there, when you look at the inside of a member here, boom, like this, in the internal loading, all you have is a normal force. And when that normal force in a single force member is in compression, then we have a column. So it doesn't matter if it's vertical, horizontal, diagonal, if it's a single force member and it only has axial compression, then that's what we're calling a column. You know, we have to pay particular attention to columns because when columns fail, they don't typically yield the material, but rather they buckle. And whenever I hear the word buckle, I think of my knees and just, oh, my knees breaking out of plane and a really bad, devastating injury. And the reality is when a column buckles, that is a catastrophic failure. You're gonna see collapse of structural systems because of the large displacements associated with buckling. Now you can feel the concept of a critical load. If you've got a ruler or a piece of spaghetti, of dry spaghetti, you can do this next little demo I'm gonna show you. So you can take that ruler and you're gonna push down on it with some force using your hand. And, if, and you're gonna feel it as you, you, know, you touch it, you're applying a load, you start increasing that load, and you can feel it maybe starting to like feel, oh, about something's gonna happen. And once you reach that critical load, what's gonna happen is all of a sudden this thing is gonna bow or bend out like this. And there's gonna be this huge displacement in this direction, and that, is the buckled shape. In any case, what you're feeling is that if I could graph it, starting from zero here, you're going, you're increasing. If this is the direction of increasing P that's being applied or this increasing compression, you're increasing the load, you know, everything is great, everything is staying upright. And then all of a sudden, bam, at some point you reach some number or some load and it buckles. This instant, just before it becomes unstable, when it buckles out, this is called a bifurcation point. While you, this region right here will have been stable equilibrium, this point right here, this bifurcation represents a neutral equilibrium, the condition right before it becomes before the structure becomes unstable. And this load, this value of the force right here, just before we reach this unstable equilibrium or buckling, we call this the critical load. And if you need a definition, this would be the maximum internal load in compression that a column can support before buckling. Now to derive an equation for this critical load, we're gonna take a, we're gonna assume an ideal column, which which does not exist in real life. But that means that we have something that's perfectly straight. And if you've ever been to Home Depot or Lowe's or tried to buy a piece of lumber, you've seen that guy looking down each two by four, trying to find the one that's perfectly straight, but does not exist. All right, so here we're gonna, but we're gonna assume that it does. We're gonna say that we have an ideal column. It's perfectly straight, no crookedness. And that this load, this internal load is applied right through the geometric centroid. And we also have a homogeneous material, same material throughout, and all the material is linear elastic. So we'll put some pin supports on this thing. It's gonna look like this. I put like this roller thing here on the side so this point can go up and down. And I have this load applied P here, boom applied this thing has some length l we'll give the member a coordinate system so here we'll say the length or long lengths we'll have the origin at the bottom here we'll say boom going upwards this way is x and then any displacements of the member we will describe as the variable v boom and when it buckles we're gonna say you know we're applying this load and it's gonna buckle in plane Gonna assume, and it's gonna look like this. Yes. And this is the deflected shape, which can be described by V of X. 
And you know, if I did some of the forces in the vertical, I would have a reaction here. P, boom, like this. And now I'm going to go ahead, ooh, 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 this deflected shape from a moment curvature relationship. If you can recall from like, let's say the double integration method or when you first derive beam theory, you recall that this display shape from, let's say, let's go with the double integration method. You had this d squared v over dx squared, which is approximately the curvature of the beam, which we could describe as m over ei. So knowing this and seeing this deflected shape, let's take a cut, bam, at some location from the origin, which we will say has a value x, all right? And this point has a displacement v of x, all right? So this distance right here is v of x, yes. And so now I'm gonna draw a free body diagram of this cut. I'll choose the bottom. So boom, I have that support reaction P. I have on the inside of my cut. Again, let's see here. I would using just basic positive internal sign convention. I'd, I could have a moment M, a normal force N in 2D and the shear force V. All right, I guess you have to turn your head sideways to see that one. <laughs> All right, and this distance right here is x. And now normally, if the deformation were small, this moment and the shear would be zero. You know, we wouldn't even have to worry about it. But we have, in buckling, we have an excessive deformation. This is v of x. So that when I apply the equilibrium equations, in particular, when I apply some of the moments about the cut, I would have m, this internal moment, plus p times v is equal to zero. Normally, this moment is zero if that deformation is small. But now we can't ignore it because we have excessive deformation. And this mo internal moment due to the buckling is negative p times v. And if I take this and I substitute it into the moment curvature relationship, I get that this d squared v over dx squared is equal to negative p times v over ei. And then if I rearrange this bad boy, I get this d squared v over dx squared plus p over ei times v equals zero. And oh snap, what? I have a second order linear ordinary differential equation and it's equal to zero, so it's homogeneous too. So that makes it a little bit easier. And now we need to solve this second order ODE. And you might need a refresher on how to solve it. for So, so for like the next 10 seconds, you can click right here and get to watch a video on a quick recap on how to solve a second order linear ODE. The general solution to this ordinary differential equation will have the form V of X right here. And we're gonna have two constants, C1 and C2 that we need to solve for. To solve for those constants, we're gonna to need to use our boundary conditions of our, our column right here. So here, the displacement at zero, V of zero should be equal to zero. And then the displacement here at the end, V of L should also be equal to zero. So my boundary conditions that I need to solve for these constants would be that V of zero equals zero and V at L is equal to zero. And so when I go ahead and I apply this V of zero equals zero, I would find that this from here, I would find that C2 equals zero. So I, I substitute zero, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, C2 equals zero, all right? And then when I substitute this, this V of L equal to zero, knowing that C2 is zero, boom, I would get V of L is equal to and there are two possibilities for this solution. I could have C1, I could say that C1 equals zero, but this is a trivial solution. It's meaningless. If both my constants are zero, that means nothing is happening and really there's no load on it, right? It's, it's just useless, the column is straight. Or this whole term right here, this term right here could equal zero. So I could say that, hey, I'm gonna have sine square root of P over EI times L. I want this to be equal to zero. And in order for that term to equal zero, I need this term right here to be some multiple, some integer multiple of pi. So this thing has to equal some 
multiple of pi, n times pi, where n is an integer. And I can solve for p here. If I solve for p, this p will be equal to, and really the critical load is going to be the lowest load that causes my column to buckle. So that would be the case where n equals 1. So when n equals 1, this critical load equation is... Now this is an important result, but I'm not going to go too crazy about this result. I'm just going to leave it right here. I don't want to circle it or highlight it because there's one little modification I'm going to make later on, okay? But here, for now, this is important and it's useful and we'll put a gray circle around it just to say that, hey, hey it was useful, right? And you know, you can look Look at this you can make all kinds of substitutions shoot it's it's popular to to determine let's say a critical stress which again i'll do in gray because gray is kind of neutral it's like ho hum it's not exactly complete right but here it's like sigma critical would be pcr divided by a and that would be give you the critical stress sometimes people introduce this variable the radius of gyration this r which is kind of a way to describe the cross-sectional area properties in one number namely the moment of inertia and area and this r is equal to the square root root of i over a and as you might suspect if you have an ix and iy values you can also have an rx and ry value and so you can substitute this radius of gyration into this equation here via the moment of inertia here if i rearrange this and i said i is equal to r squared times a then i can introduce that here and the way that it's usually written is that the critical load here is equal to pi squared e a over L over R quantity squared like this. And this L over R is a slenderness ratio. But again, there's something missing in this. So I'm not going to go all crazy and circle it with fun colors. I'm just going to circle it in gray because it's an important result for now while we understand.